Michael Albertine's eulogy. A reading from Numbers chapter 3, verse 13. For all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I am a firstborn, the firstborn of a firstborn. Michael Aubertine was born on April 26, 1948, to his mother Evelina Modest and his father Mitchell George in the city of Castries. The Second World War had culminated not too long before, and there was a euphoria of new opportunity. Fascism was dealt a resounding blow, and the world was liberated. St. Lucia went about its work. On the night of June 19, 1948, a tailor's shop on the northeastern part of the town burst into flames. The breeze was so strong that it spread the fire throughout most of the town. Castries was devastated. That baby's mother, Miss Evie, had to hurriedly escape the inferno with her newborn month and a half little boy. Out of the ashes of that devastation was a rebirth of sorts, a theme that was to seemingly follow this child throughout his life. Michael was a precocious little boy always dressed to the nines in his dundat. His father was a military man having enlisted in the Royal Army during the war and was a musician at that, so his purportment of dress was impeccable. A little sister came a few years after, Auntie Jean, and he got thrust into the role that would frame his life's work thereafter. Mike became a big brother. Circumstances being what they were, Mike assisted his mother with raising another eight siblings. Four boys, Uncle Bina, Uncle Zap, Uncle Brian, and Uncle Pimpo, and four girls, Auntie Rosie, Auntie Cheryl, Auntie Audrey, and Auntie Maggie. He attended the St. Aloysius, I'm sorry, St. Aloysius R.C. Boys School, where his teachers developed his inquisitive nature and love for reading. Despite his obvious intelligence, the purse strings and responsibilities had a different path for his education career. Many of his peers went on to high school and Mike became a teacher at the RC Boys School at the young age of 13. Those were nurturing times. Mike possessed the perfect qualities to make an amazing teacher. His patience and persistence, despite his small stature, were qualities frequently referenced by seemingly older gentlemen who stopped him on the road in his later years, telling me that your father taught me in school. They looked older than he did. How was that even possible, I asked myself, but it was absolutely correct. One hilarious situation found Mike being lambasted by the headmaster's strap being mistaken for one of the students. His academic genius was not lost on the faculty as he was re awarded a scholarship to finally attend that prestigious institution that eluded him a few years before. Mike would find his seat at the St. Mary's College, joining in fourth form. He would excel in his studies and also develop his writing and musical skills at SMC. He started liming with the CYO fellas and thought himself quite the baller, having the audacity of being in the bars for a presentation house against the likes of Cloudin, Shining, and Chortet from Rodney. His face burned him a few times, but he actually saved goals, even a penalty. Gus Small would be the Huck Finn to his Tom Sawyer, and they would forge a lifelong friendship. Musical influences like the Beatles caused them to start their own band, the Beatniks, along with Winston Maynard and Mark Lord, with a two-part harmony that rivaled the sound of the Everly Brothers. Quiet in his nature, he was also a disciplinarian as his siblings knew all too well. Not hesitating to meet out the frequent corrective actions to the bewilderment of his brothers and sisters. Auntie Rosie would say, eh, eh, the boy think he's our father, eh? One of those instances found Mike crossing the Marshall Bridge where his mom, who was a firebrand in her own right, was engaged in a verbal exchange with a male individual. And upon happening onto this scenario, Mike, who, like every young guy of that time, carried his ratchet in his back pocket. When the guy feigned to slapping his mother, he stepped in and quietly told him, if you call yourself Batman, just touch her. 
The deliberate control and focus in his voice was enough to give our agitator pause. And he quickly changed his posturing with the, Oh, you bad! You bad! To which Mike retorted, I'm not bad, but if you call yourself bad man, touch her. Right around that time, the family lived in an infamous part of the city, Grass Street. Back then, it was an enclave of middle-class and upwardly mobile families separated by a river. On one side, Mike lived with a number of precocious boys, like himself, Gus Small, Peter Springer, just to name a few, and on the other side was the apple of his eye, one of Mr. Joe's daughters in particular, the one with the name like a flower, with any other name and would smell as sweet. His friends thought he was crazy, having the audacity to want to try a thing on Mr. Joe's daughter. He has a death wish, they thought. He will end up a branch in that oven's hearth. Mike was never one to back down from an adventure. Persistence was his best trait. A whirlwind courtship ensued much to the demise of Mr. Glasgow's rose bushes and his persistence paid off. They would be quite the item, sharing a lot in common. She being a teacher at the T. Roger School herself. He was 16 and she was 15. They courted for six years. Mike was an avid spear fisher in those days and he would go out with his spear gun and catch some beautiful specimens. He would bring it back to her and she would tell him, boy, bring your fish to your mother tongue. I tell you I want fish. A real shabby. She had aspirations for nursing which led her to the UK for her studies in 1968. I can't imagine what was going through his mind. He ended up as part of a student exchange contingent representing St. Lucia, which found him traveling to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Canada, and he wasn't even there to see her off. It took two weeks by cruise ship to get to England. When he got back to St. Lucia, he immediately began to source out a way to be with her, and lo and behold, Mike found a way. He applied for a scholarship to train to teach English as a second language at Murray House in Edinburgh, Scotland, just a stone's throw from Norfolk, England, where his rose was studying. Talk about bull target persistence. He wasn't about to let his rose go. They got married soon after, and they had the gem of an offspring, which would solidify that unit. Mike and his little family came back to St. Lucia and started to carve out a life. He very quickly got to work both professionally and creatively. He went back to teacher's college on the morn where he sharpened his teaching chops. He also created the Calypso alter ego which would become famous in its own right. But what to call himself, he thought. There were the greats at the time like the mighty Sparrow, mighty Troctus, mighty Shadow, mighty Pele. He would adopt the moniker Mighty Mighty in true Mike fashion. It was brilliant. He went on to compete in the Calypso arena, penning some of the great Kaiso gems like the hard-hitting, politically charged, making bread on the dead, about a well-known bank acquiring piece of a cemetery to erect a branch, and frustrated teacher about the political machinations within public service. These amazing pieces crescendo to the cleverly worded puns of Now I sure is my fin como, and Deep ball the second boss, he have too much say tight shit and big brother and a quirky satirical Bullen family saga and UFO were just another one of his brilliance. He went on to win the 1979 Independence Calypso title with Jumping Defense, one of his crowning musical achievements. By that time, he had already penned a play, Invocation, which was produced by the Creative and Performing Arts Society in 1972 alongside plays by famed Barbadian poet Kamal Brathwaite and Stanley French. Mike held his own alongside the literary greats. Dame Perlet Louise actually played a significant role in that play invocation. Mike wasn't one for the limelight and pomp. He increased his family brood by one with the birth of his princess, Nicole Alma Aubertine, on May 27, 1976. Another apple for that eye. Renewed with creative fervor, he quietly entered a short story called Calypso Finals into a BBC World short story competition, and representing St. Lucia, beat the whole world winning that competition in 1977. I remembered him having to go to a neighbor's house to use their phone for the live radio interview with the BBC. The irony isn't lost on me. Mike had no ego. He would do whatever it took to put food on the table for his family. 
His public service teacher paycheck, along with his wife's nursing paycheck, combined was insufficient to be eligible for a mortgage. Undaunted, he turned his back on what he loved the most and took a job which would pay more, selling cigarettes and liquor out of a van driving around the island for a local wholesale retailer. He did score that mortgage for his final. This was a man of conviction. This work, Mighty Laughs, contained within were the gems Claws, Calypso Finals, the BBC winner, and the acclaimed market vendor, with the popular refrain, Patat Moi Go Lo. Soon after that endeavor, the next year, he would be blessed with another offspring, the bookend of his trinity, Miguel Aubertine, on March 14, 1979, the Independence Baby. Now, please don't let it go unnoticed that at the root of those endeavors was a man speaking truth to power and paying the price dearly for his creative activism. He employed every creative tool he had to provide for his family. That same Mighty Laugh short story publication was followed by a live LP recording catching the sunbeams, Michael Oritin live, with his comedic genius. None of these creative works were enough to pay the bill, so he tried his hand in insurance. And again, the powers that be sought to cap his abilities. The pervading underbelly of business in a small island nation belied getting your hands dirty in a way that Mike had not the stomach for. In truth, that was a common theme in many of his endeavors. There was always that principality he was fighting which sought to try to break his resolve. But Mike had the power of the Most High on his side throughout. He tried his hand in advertising and excelled within that sphere as well, producing some of the most well-remembered jingles and 30-second commercials of the time, filled with wit and energy, at the same time getting the branding across. Long hours were spent at the RSL studios, where the greats of the discipline attended to his production requirements, many of whom have passed on. This endeavor fell prey to that same principality as well. Mike had the uncanny ability to reinvent himself, a reincarnation from one form to the next. Whenever there was the proverbial burning of an attempt, he would morph into something much more resilient. Out of the ashes rises the phoenix, he would say to me. Flowers must all fall before the fruit come. He began his production stint with Catholic Television Broadcasting Service, CTBS where, with his love for the island, his creativity, a VHS editing suite and camera, shepherded untold souls with his service to the Most High. Indeed, that era within the church created some of the most memorable experiences through the medium, which culminated with Hands Across St. Lucia, a grassroots attempt at an apolitical show of fundamental nationalist fervor and pride, and led thousands of men, women, and children for a hike from Miku to Zufra through the forest, a hike we won't soon forget. Some would say the marketing was too successful, for everyone wanted to find that waterfall in the forest depicted on the ad with my god sister Bubbles bathing with wanton abandon. The success of that endeavor enabled an opportunity to attain his master's in education in mass media at the University of Manchester in 1987, with his thesis on patterns of gender socialization in St. Lucia. When he came back to St. Lucia, he went on to become the last director of culture from 1998 to 2001 and worked very closely with the Folk Research Center. He led the St. Lucian delegation to Carafesta in St. Kitts in 2000. The research into his dissertation afforded him the opportunity to begin a novel loosely based on the historical facts uncovered. Neg Mawa, Freedom Fighter, was born published by the Caribbean Diaspora Press of Medgar Evers College in New York. It is highly regarded as a historical novel, and the works of Michael Overton has consistently been lauded as required reading for an educational program within the educational system of St. Lucia. With a small budget from the Cultural Ministry, he produced a short film, Strategic Withdrawal, based on his novel Negmawa, about the historical significance of his research. He enlisted the help and assistance of several young people, including myself and my siblings, to bring the, that work to life at no cost, with all of the budget going towards costume and post-production. It was a miraculous labor of love. 
Mike also worked briefly within the Tourist Board as Education Officer and was also the local director of the United States Peace Corps, assisting the U.S. director with logistics and know-how. During his stint as local Peace Corps director, he moonlighted as copywriting consultant for the PRS, Performance Rights Society, advocating for intellectual property remittances on behalf of creatives in St. Lucia and across the world. He was thrust into the limelight when his services were utilized on an episode of the popular Braxton Family Values, where he officiated the renewal of vows between one of the Braxton sisters making a cameo appearance himself on the syndicated show. It's very easy to frame a hero in the prism of a familiar eye, the window to a verdant vista of complex simplicity, a quiet stature of immense influence. So much has been said about his community service, his love for his land, his professional conviction, his creative genius. Under all of that larger than life persona, who was ice coldly confident behind the microphone, he was our father, he was our brother, our uncle, our cousin, our godfather, a loyal friend. And he was, as Mama Rose puts it, my husband. When people saw my dad with his broad smile, they knew intrinsically what was responsible for it. He shared an amazing bond with one woman his entire life. I remember one day telling him that my life's goal was to be just like him. He asked me what I meant by that. I told him I wanted to be a Mike, raise a family, and devote myself to them just like he did. He told me I could never be a Mike until I found my rose. Right there, it all made sense to me. These two people were a unit, right down to the last dance that they shared together, to the saxophone of Dylan's and Jules. Their love was palpable. They wore it on their foreheads. The way that mom cared for him during the last few years and the grace with which they faced that challenge is a testament to what God looks like. If we say God is love, then God dwelt between those two for all to see. When dad was on his hospital bed in New York, he made me promise to get mom a card for Valentine's Day from himself. I threw in some flowers. I say that to bring to mind that he never took her for granted. They were a shining example for so many couples in their church activities with engagement encounter, marriage encounter, and the countless counseling. They had the marriage playbook down packed. Not only did they talk that talk, but till the end, they walked it. Mom said caring for dad was a privilege, for nobody deserved it more than him. He treated her like a queen because he was her king. They taught that love like bread should be made fresh every day. What a lovely bakery they shared. Many people know exactly who Michael Aubertine was to them. As different as all his roles were, one thread was inextricably woven through that wonderful tapestry, and that is his spiritual conviction. Here lied a godly man, a God-fearing man, a humble man. There was another woman in Daddy's life who he definitely had a very soft spot for. Daddy was in love with the Blessed Virgin. And from a young age, he was a member of the Legion of Mary. He prayed and taught us the rosary with fervor. And her presence was always around, whether by fragrant smell or apparition. He knew she was his advocate. He was especially excited when Pope Paul created the luminous mystery. As he said, he always believed the life of Christ was a missing link in that holy prayer. Please join me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The love that he shared so effortlessly and unselfishly was mirrored in the individuals from the varied walks of life who were lucky enough to have known him. He was the dad everyone wanted their dad to be. Indeed he was. All the Christ Our Redeemer core retreat kids called him dad. Uncle Mike to all the kids on Entrepot Summit. Dad always had time for anyone who needed his attention. His warm smile welcomed you in, followed by the affirming 
Mm -hmm. ever so often to assure you that he was listening to every word. Here was a man who truly understood that tried and true tenet. By his deeds shall a man be known. With so many accolades gone unheeded, yet never wavering in his commitment to his country, he strived to ensure his legacy. Not a word, but an acronym as he constantly reminded me. L-E-G-A-C-Y. Let every generation after celebrate you. He was a family man through and through. He lived his private life without rules or stringent boundaries. We were always ready for what he had cooking up next. At any time, he was willing and able to veer off the beaten path in search of the next adventure. Whether it was in search of the new river Basset and waterfall, the new beach, the new promontory, the new cliff for buigo hunting, which we invariably found a way to dive off of. An avid swimmer, he loved the ocean. We grew up in the water. Beach parties, river parties, waterfalls, bassin, ponds, quarries. If water was in it, we swam it. He ended up a qualified paddy scuba diver, and we shared the beauty of the underwater environment of St. Lucia, diving under the pitons and ashasne, some of his favorite dives. He was always up for a challenge. When we went cliff diving at the back of Pigeon Island on the so christened Parabonga Cliff, Daddy would be jumping off the 45-foot cliff. He would take our sister for a hike of a lifetime up the Gopiton and spend the night camping on the peak. He would ask me for his favorite rock song whilst he drove to Viewfort with his diesel truck. Final countdown for that extra adrenaline rush as he role-played an F1 driver. Daddy loved movies. Storming the beaches of Normandy at Raidweed Beach with branches for machine guns. Holding his hand over his head as he swam like a shark, stalking us in the shallows like jaws. At any given moment, you had to be ready to drop everything and get your bath suit because we would all pile into the back of the van and were off to the next adventure. Daddy practiced TM with fervor. For the uninitiated, this was transcendental meditation. He trained himself for years to still his mind and journey within to tap and access to a spiritual world. At the young age of seven, I remember walking into a room and finding him standing on his head in the middle of the room with his legs straight up, not touching anything around him. His eyes were closed, and in fact, he was fast asleep on his head, as I thought, because despite my pains to wake him, including peeling his eyes open, they were rolled back in his head, and no amount of screaming his name directly into his ears would wake him up. As abruptly as possible, once he was done, he would all of a sudden get down or dismount, as the case may be, and, and ask me nonchalantly if I needed something. Once when watching Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos and the Universe, he got up abruptly and with excitement exclaimed that he knew and had visited the Magellan Cloud Nebula, a black hole. It was either my dad was a raving lunatic or he was telling me the truth, and knowing him as I did, I had to choose the latter. Rigsby was not an option. He said it was during one of his deep TM sessions he was finally able to let go and he found himself whizzing over the cosmos in a lucid state. But he was afraid of a dark place in the universe as he approached, which until that episode he hadn't known what it was called, but recognized it as the Magellan Cloud. <laughs> Quintessential Michael Oberty. When everyone else was lifting weights, he would be in the bathroom sweating up a storm, practicing Bruce Lee's dynamic tension, making one punch last three minutes, as if in super slow motion. When everyone else would drink magnesia for a bellyache, he would be in a mirror with a glass of water on his hands over his midsection, meditating, and then drank the water afterwards. Bellyache gone. My dad, as my brother Miguel would say, was the very best. One of the last adventures we went on was a kayak excursion that I organized for him with Andre St. Thomas Dive for Helen in 2018. The hidden mangrove. The, uh, the great Mike there. <laughs> Getting it good for the time. Blessed love. Oh gosh, boy, we're going inside there? Yeah, that's the pit right there. Respect.
When I told my mom of my intention, she called me crazy. And when she asked dad if he wanted to go, his reaction was a gleeful smile. Till the last, despite his inabilities, his adventurous spirit never wavered. We got in the kayak at Marigo Bay. I told him if we turned over the kayak that I would fall in as well so he shouldn't worry. I would keep him safe. I asked if he was nervous and he replied and assured not at all. And we commenced to paddling to the mouth of the Rosa River where we took the kayaks over the beach into the river itself. We paddled into the white mangrove forest there and were greeted by the solace of the beautiful habitat. He closed his eyes and I couldn't help but allow the kayak guide to go on ahead as we drifted silently behind. We shared a moment there. I began to sing the chaplet of the divine mercy in its entirety. He was silent the entire time. Chano. Really beautiful. Yeah, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. I go to that place when I think of him now. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, fame and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. He loved. That's what he was about. He loved his country. He loved his family. He loved his people. Thank you for loving him back. Blessed love.